So one of the um, exciting things about being a biologist now is that we have this incredible opportunity to sequence genomes of organisms, not only humans, but sort of any organism we want. And with all of this data, um, we're finding variants in these genomes, mutations. And at the extremes, there's really two types of mutations. Uh, and we're interested in those types of mutations for different reasons. So for example, there are mutations that we consider deleterious or or harmful. And so there are a lot of people who are very interested in identifying these mutations, especially those that affect, let's say, human disease. But I'm particularly interested in sort of the other end of the spectrum, and those are mutations that are beneficial or increase fitness, um, that is, increase our ability to survive and reproduce. But this is the big challenge. How do we sort those mutations? How do we know which ones are important? And then finally, how do we know which ones are actually beneficial and can we test them um, to show that they're actually beneficial? And so one of the ways we approach this question is to use wild mice. And we study wild mice because um, they're a great great model system in the sense that they're closely related to laboratory mice. So we can bring them into the lab, we can do controlled crosses, um, we have a lot of genetic and genomic tools that we can borrow from these models that have been set, studied for over a century. But on the other hand, we also get this added benefit in that we can study them in their natural environment and really test in the wild where they evolved if, if and how mutations actually benefit their survival and reproduction. So when we started the lab, one of the first traits we were interested in was color, color adaptation. And this is because it's a trait that's easy to measure, and we already have a hint that um, color can be important for survival. So as mice are running around in their natural habitats, they're constantly being barraged by uh, attacks from predators. And one of their primary defenses is simply to blend into their environment. So we know from old natural history studies that there's a very strong correlation between the dorsal color of a mouse and the substrate in which it's running around in. So mice that live, for example, at the extreme on lava flows tend to be melanic or almost black in color. And the mice we study are mice that occupy these beautiful white sand beaches off the coast of Florida. And maybe not surprisingly, they're almost completely white in color, which helps camouflage them. So our goal was to try to identify the DNA variants, the DNA base pair changes that affect, let's say, pigmentation genes that then affect their color of their coats, which then affect their ability to survive in the wild. So the question is, how, how do you go about doing this? And here's another reason we study mice, is that um, we can take mice, let's say these light-colored mice from the Florida beaches, and their mainland counterparts, which are dark brown, matching the loamy soils in, let's say, central Florida, and we can do genetic crosses. So we can bring them into the lab, um, put them in a cage together, they'll produce offspring, and then they will produce offspring. And by doing these genetic crosses, that allows us to pinpoint the precise regions of the genome that contain genes and mutations that affect their color. And these are experiments, you know, we would love to do, for example, in humans, but of course it's impossible for lots of, uh, lots of re obvious reasons. So with these mice, what we're able to do then is find the genes and then start to dissect those genes down to mutations. So about five years ago, we were able to do this um, and identify a gene called the melanocortin-1 receptor. Now, this is a receptor um, like uh, a mini uh, transmembrane receptor that sits on the uh, membrane of a cell, and its job is to take information from outside the cell and translate it inside the cell. This particular receptor sits on melanocytes. These are our pigment-producing cells. And it's really the switch that determines whether that cell is going to produce dark or light pigmentation. And when we sequence this gene in our light, almost white beach mice compared to the mainland mice, we found a mutation in there. And that mutation coded for an amino acid change. And that amino acid change then changes the function of that receptor. And we could actually take the receptor, these two forms that differ by this one amino acid change, and test how they behave differently in a cell culture. And in doing so, what we found is that the form that comes in the light mouse actually is a weaker receptor. It doesn't do as well as signaling inside the cell. And the result of that is to produce lighter pigmentation compared to the mainland mouse. And so here we've identified a mutation that affects the function of the receptor and causes these mice to be lighter in color.
which we think affects um, its survival. But of course, we wanted to test if this actually affects the survival, right? Because the goal is to connect DNA to fitness. And so we had to do another experiment, and that was to show that color actually matters to survival. So one way you could imagine doing this experiment would be to take a bunch of beach mice and a bunch of mainland mice and maybe give them little ear tags and release them into the wild. So maybe 100 of them, uh, 50, 50 dark and 50 light in the light soil, and 50 light and 50 dark on the dark soil. Uh, and then see who survives over the course of several weeks, right? But that's a complicated experiment, and um, nobody wants us to be moving mice around. So we did what I consider the next best experiment, and in some ways even slightly better. Um, we could make um, models of mice. So this is a plasticine model of a mouse. It's slightly missing its tail. Um, so these are made out of sort of a, a, a soft clay. And they're modeled just after the mice that we see in the wild. And then what we could do is paint half of them dark and half of them light to mimic the natural mice in the field. And then we could do the experiment that I was just telling you about. We release them along transects in both habitat types. And um, we could see if they get attacked. Now, the upside of this experiment, of course, is that we control for everything but color. So all the mice have this sort of base form. They're made out of the same thing. They're the same size and shape and everything. And they just differ in their color. If we had used real mice, for example, they could differ, let's say, in their escape behavior or their activity or other things that would confound the experiment. But here we're just controlling for color. The downside of the experiment, of course, is we didn't know if we could fool the predators. Uh, but I wouldn't be telling you this, of course, if um, the experiment didn't work. So we could put these out and hawks would come out, hawks, herons, um, some mammalian carnivores like foxes and coyotes, and they would attack these model mice and leave either bill imprints or tooth imprints with footprints around. So we could quantify how much it mattered to be the color of this local soil. And what we found is it mattered a lot, that if you matched your local soil, you had about a 50% increase in your ability to survive. So we identified a mutation in a gene, the melanocortin-1 receptor, that causes that receptor to de decrease in signaling. That, in turn, causes the mice to have a lighter coat. And I just told you that having a lighter coat, in fact, um, increases your survival in the wild. So this was one of the first examples in which we could link a DNA-based pair change to survival in a natural population. So this was a really exciting um, first step. But this sounds like a very simple story, and, and in part it is, but it's not just about this one gene. In fact, when we looked at the experiment as a whole, there were three regions of the genome that were associated with lighter color. So I told you a story about the melanocortin-1 receptor, and that, in some sense, is the simplest story. But there are two other genes that we know to be involved. Another gene is called the agouti signaling protein. And interestingly, it actually physically interacts with the melanocortin-1 receptor. It's a signaling um, peptide that's secreted from the derma papilla, which is at the base of the hairs. And like MC1R, plays a role in determining whether light or dark pigment is produced. And so what we found is that agouti, um, like MC1R, comes out in our genome scan. But when we sequenced the protein, we didn't find any mutations. And in this case, it's not a mutation in the protein, but it's a mutation in the regulatory region, which affects the expression level of that protein. And what we found is that agouti represses the melanocortin-1 receptor. And in our light-colored beach mice, in fact, it was expressed at a higher level. So in other words, there's two ways to get light coloration. You can either take the melanocortin-1 receptor and decrease its signaling, or you can take the molecule that decreases melanocortin signaling and increase its expression. And really, together, these two genes is what produces a much lighter color. But there's a third player. And that's a gene that we know much less about. It acts genetically upstream of agouti. And we also found an increase in expression in that gene associated with lighter color. And it's really the combination of those three that produces the light color of these um, beach mice. Now I think we sort of have the players in the system. And we're starting to unravel how those interact to produce this sort of unique adapted color pattern of these mice living on the Florida beaches. And this is where things, I think, get really fun as sort of an evolutionary biologist and as a molecular biologist. Because as an evolutionary biologist, we have these genes in hand now, and we can start to ask questions about molecular mechanism. So for example, you can query that gene, 
and using patterns of nucleotide variation, so the variation in DNA in that gene across individuals, you can estimate the strength of selection, which I told you was already strong based on our um, clay model experiments. We can estimate the age of the allele that causes light coloration. And what's great about that is our estimate is that it's about 3,000 years old. And we know something about the geology of these islands. They're also about 3,000 to 6,000 years old. So there's a nice coordination between those two. And you can use these patterns of genetic variation to sort of go back in time, which is what evolutionary biologists like to do. We study what happened in the past. But of course, we can't go, we can't time travel. So finding genes and looking at patterns of uh, genetic variation sort of um, allow us to tell a story and to get clues about what happened in the past. And then the other thing we can do, now I'm putting on my hat as a molecular biologist, is we also want to know how mutations cause changes in traits. So for example, I told you about the melanocortin-1 receptor. We know how that works. It works by changing, um, changing the signaling properties of that receptor, which causes a change in the type of pigment that a uh, melanocyte produces. But we also want to know more general things, like in this agouti mutation that causes a change in expression, how does it do that? Is there a repressor that this mutation or mutations knock out? Is it a new enhancer that evolves? You know, how is it that gene expression evolves at the molecular level? And so we can now, we sort of ha once we have the genes, we have a handle to try to identify mutations and then work out exactly the molecular mechanisms that give rise to new phenotypes. So together, um, we hope to tell stories or to understand um, a little bit more about evolutionary mechanisms as well as the underlying molecular mechanisms that give rise to novel phenotypes that improve the ability of wild organisms like these beach mice to survive and reproduce in the wild. <laughs>